Secretary Buttigieg, thank you for being here. It's really great to talk to you. Um, we are talking a little bit after uh, the White House has now accepted a bipartisan infrastructure deal. Can you tell us a little bit about the thinking inside this administration about why uh, such a significant compromise was something that you all were willing to do on this particular issue? This is a bill that deals with physical infrastructure uh, right in your wheelhouse as Secretary of Transportation, uh, but it doesn't deal with a lot of other things that maybe some Democrats wanted. Well, the, the president believes in a bold vision. He also believes in partnership. He believes in compromise where possible. And uh, that's what we've been able to do with this bipartisan deal. This is, let's be very clear, a major, major, to the point of being historic, investment in the transportation infrastructure and other forms of infrastructure in this country. Uh, we're talking about the biggest federal commitment for public transit ever, uh, the most committed to passenger rail since Amtrak was created in the first place, some of the biggest investments on roads and bridges since the Eisenhower administration, getting lead out of the pipes uh, that take water to American children, making sure everybody's able to have a affordable and fast internet. Uh, it's a major, major opportunity to really set America up to succeed. You know, it's been clear from the beginning that uh, at least part of the president's agenda, part of the president's vision for, for this country and economy was something that we could do together across the aisle. Not all of it clearly, but some of it. And what we've been able to do is identify that part and do it together, even while working on two tracks, because uh, it remains uh, no less important to us uh, than before this deal was struck to continue pushing on child care, to continue pushing on other things we need to do around climate, to continue pushing on uh, things like building up the infrastructure of our veterans' hospitals. There's a lot more work to do, but we're thrilled about the possibility of doing this part together and across the aisle. You know, I, I think the idea of a broader definition of infrastructure, one that encompasses human infrastructure, um, and, and also one that looks deeply at climate issues is something that Democrats were very interested in. I know that you're very interested in. But why do you think it is that on the Republican side there has been very little interest in that? And do you think that we will, as a country, get to a point where those things are viewed as just as important as the bridge down the road or, you know, uh, the, the crosswalk, uh, you know, on your street? Well, what, one thing we know is that all of the elements of infrastructure that today we consider traditional infrastructure, they didn't start out traditional. Uh, like nothing could be more traditional than, uh, I don't know, a railroad. But there was a time when a railroad was uh, was tech, w was new. Uh, you know, the, the transcontinental railroad wasn't traditional infrastructure until we built it. You could say the same about the Erie Canal. You could say the same about the interstate highway system. So yes, I do believe that over time we will continue to see an expansion of our understanding of what infrastructure means because uh, paradoxically that's part of the American tradition around infrastructure, pushing that frontier. And you do see some of that reflected in the bipartisan package, right? Internet is obviously pretty new. Nobody was talking about the internet under Eisenhower, but today being connected to the internet is just as important as being connected to the interstate highway system. You, you need both. Uh, same thing with uh, our expansion of, of things around, uh, uh, let's say, the urgency of clean water. Uh, now, we believe that care infrastructure matters, health infrastructure matters, housing infrastructure matters. Uh, that has been harder to do on a bipartisan basis, but that doesn't make it any less important to do. And we think, uh, in fact, we know that most Americans agree. You, um, you've also spoken a lot about this issue of uh, racial equity in talking about transportation and talking about infrastructure broadly. What can you tell us about what remains in this bipartisan package that addresses uh, that equity question? And um, there has been some criticism that this was a deal struck by an entirely white group of United States senators, and maybe bipartisan, but not diverse in other ways. Uh, what do you say to people who say that's just not um, the composition of a group of people who is going to create an equitable bill that deals with uh, issues that are important to uh, black and Latino and native communities who need infrastructure to work for them too? 
Well, it's certainly true that the composition of the U.S. Senate does not reflect the uh, composition of the American people. But it's also true uh, that the input and the voices and the needs of all Americans uh, weighed on the, the people making decisions and guiding this approach, uh, including the president. I mean, starting with the president and the vice president and the leadership of this administration, prioritizing racial equity, which is absolutely something that is inseparable from transportation. And, and you do see a lot of that reflected in this package. For example, the president stood firm on making sure that there is a lot in here on transit, uh, something that uh, that wasn't present in, in the earlier rounds of negotiations, but the president held uh, to it because it's, it's important for America. Also, uh, commuters of color, uh, Americans of color, black Americans, disproportionately more likely to rely on public transit. You look at the investments in safety. Uh, unfortunately, there there is a huge racial gap in things like uh, fatalities on our roads. Uh, there is funding in this bipartisan package to reconnect communities that had been divided by infrastructure decisions in the past, like highways that were routed, sometimes deliberately, to segregate uh, a city or, or even to effectively remove a black neighborhood by, by routing a highway straight through it. So uh, when we're talking about all of these racial equity considerations, they're reflected in this package. But uh, this is another example of, and reminder of why these two tracks are important. There's a lot more we've got to do as a country, as an administration, and we will. I want to ask you a little bit more about that because this is, I mean, this is Aspen Ideas that we're talking at about. And this idea of highways going through communities of color is one um, that is such a big issue in every city, big and small, across the country. But what does that look like? I mean, and as the Secretary of Transportation, usually you're talking about building highways. Are we talking about demolishing highways when we talk about reconnecting those communities? Well, yeah, it turns out that the right transportation policy is not just about more, more, more. What can we add? It's what do we add and subtract? It's how do we shape uh, our infrastructure so that people can get around? And uh, the truth is highways can connect but they can also divide, which is why we need to be intentional about this. As, as, as you correctly said, Abby, often it's uh, uh, in northern as well as southern cities, everywhere in the country, we've seen examples of this. So what does it look like to do something about it? Sometimes it does mean that a highway needs to move or, or maybe it needs to be capped or put underground. And by the way, when you cap a highway, there, there's something else extraordinary that happens, which is land is returned. Uh, to being able to uh, to create value for a community. Other times it may not look as dramatic as, as removing or sinking a highway. It may be working across it, bridging, literally, over or under it, or adding transit options for uh, uh, an area or a neighborhood that, that hasn't had good transit. I talked to one mayor in, in a low-income community, who, who which is a suburb of New York, describing to me how it's uh, quicker for her residents to get to Manhattan than it is to get across town to get to the grocery. We can do something about that. Sometimes by subtracting or moving or shifting, sometimes by adding something new. I want to switch gears a little bit to uh, COVID-19, which is something that obviously is one of those transformational global events. Um, but, but starting a little bit more local, just quickly, uh, mask mandates are kind of disappearing all over the place uh, quickly as we come out of this pandemic. They still uh, exist in airports, on public transportation. How long do you think that will go on? Well, I know there's a lot of impatience to get that part back to normal, too. I feel it. Uh, I was yeah. uh, uh, just on an aircraft. It, it would be nice uh, not to, to need those masks. But, of course, these decisions are, are guided by public health. And when you're in an environment like transit, certainly an airplane where uh, you can't exactly uh, get up and walk away if you don't feel safe, uh, and, and where you have unusually large numbers of people from very different places, uh, physically very close to each other, things are a little bit different than at the mall or, uh, or, or at a bar. But uh, we do believe that, that it will be possible. Uh, to move from, from those mandates to provided this all-important race between the vaccines and the variants is something that we win for the vaccines. It's yet another reason why it's so important for us to make sure as many Americans as possible get that vaccine, because that, I think, is the single biggest thing that will make it possible for public health leadership in the administration to feel comfortable adjusting the, the guidance on, on these restrictions. I, I assume that's something that's being discussed actively in the administration right now? Yeah, this is definitely a live topic. I mean, we want to make sure that uh, there, there is good public health guidance, that there's common sense, and that it's responding to reality and facts on the ground. So, uh, uh, you know, we're never going to go by just kind of arbitrary uh, uh, dates or, or plans. We're, we're always going to be checking it against the reality. Right. 
Um, on the, the broader issue of how COVID has changed our lives, uh, people are making decisions about where they live, how far they live from their work, what they want their commutes to look like. And as you are thinking about what transportation policy needs to look like for the next eight to 10 years, we're debating a bill that's talking about spending for almost the next decade. How does the, the change forced by COVID-19 factor into that? Well, we don't know exactly what that next normal is going to look like, but I think we know that it's not going to be quite like 2019, nor should it. We are seeing dramatic changes in the way people work and, and a lot of organizations reevaluating and reconsidering when work means sitting at a workstation in an office in a physical place versus uh, working uh, in ways that you can do from anywhere. Uh, even as an organization ourselves, as a department with 55,000 employees, we're going through this right now, figuring out, okay, when do we need to ask or, or require people to be in a room with each other and when is that uh, simply not necessary? That could have profound implications on everything from commuting patterns to land use to real estate. Uh, it doesn't make sense to try to guess or predict how all of that's going to shake out. It does make sense, I think, to double down on creating good options, precisely because we don't know exactly where all of this is headed. We need a transportation system that revolves around people's lives, around their, their needs and their aspirations, uh, which, by the way, means that uh, uh, things like vehicles and roads should revolve around human beings and their lives, not the other way around. It's why we want good transit options. It's why we want uh, uh, good uh, uh, ways to, to have an alternative not to bring a vehicle with you everywhere you go and drag two tons of metal with you across town uh, or, or to another town if there's another way. And of course, uh, it is a reminder for all of us about how digital infrastructure really is just as important as physical infrastructure. You've described this um, infrastructure package as a, also a, a jobs bill. That's the administration's position as well. There have been uh, a lot of reports about a worker shortage in this country. Are you concerned at all that uh, that there might actually be difficulty getting people to do these jobs that are potentially being created by, you know, some five hundred billion dollars in new spending? Well, to me, one of the most exciting things about this is the opportunity that it's going to create because they're, they're not just any jobs. They're good paying jobs, union jobs. But also, the majority of the jobs we're talking about don't require a university degree. They're available to Americans whether you went to college or not. So these are exactly the kinds of jobs that it will always make sense to try to create more of. Now, yes, we also have to make sure that we're creating a workforce that's ready. Part of that has to do with our education system. Part of it has to do with our skilled trades and our labor unions and the work that they do. Uh, look, in a healthy economy, uh, you, you will always see employers competing for workers, and, and you'll see uh, pay and, and, and wages and standards of living increase. It doesn't all happen on its own. Uh, it, it's why we think it's important to make workforce investments, too, and that's absolutely part of the president's vision. Um, when you uh, are, let's say, running for president in 2028, what will be your big innovative idea uh, for the country? It could be about transportation. It could be about anything else. Well, I'm, I'm very focused on the job that I have right now. And, uh, and what I'll say is I think the 2020s are probably going to be filled with more innovation in transportation than uh, maybe at any time in our lifetimes. I mean, the changes that are happening, vehicle electrification, automation, uh, drones, I mean, the, the stuff that's happening in our airspace is extraordinary. Now, as a former mayor, I'm always focused on some of the less sexy but incredibly important innovations. It could well be that across all of the things we could achieve with, with flying cars, automation, you name it, one of the most important things we achieve might be advances in uh, materials, pavement. I, I know it doesn't sound as, as exciting as sizzling, but uh, there is work going on, including work that's, that's happening with, with federal support, on things like self-healing concrete, uh, forms of pavement that can uh, drink water, permeable pavement, instead of it uh, sheeting off into runoff, pavement that lasts longer. I know this sounds really, you know, li literally uh, uh, on the ground and, and, and in the weeds, but getting things like that right can actually unlock enormous amounts of opportunity and will be just as exciting, if maybe a little harder to, uh, to, to sell, uh, than the, the technological things we're going to see above the ground. All right. Well, so we'll be looking for your pavement platform <laughs> <laughs> in about in about uh, eight eight to ten years. Um, one final thing, um, 
it is Pride Month. I want to ask you about um, some major developments. Uh, Carl Nassie became the first NFL player to uh, active player to come out as openly gay. Uh, I wonder what that means to you as a, a gay man, but also at the same time that this is happening, there is this big push across the country to uh, restrict the, the rights of transgender uh, people uh, across the country. Both things happening at the same time. What do you make of that? I, I think that's always been the, the story of, of LGBTQ plus equality, steps forward and steps back. And, and seeing Carl Nassib come out is, is extraordinary. It's encouraging. Uh, there, there's a lot of pressure and, and a lot of courage that is required to, to be a first, especially a stereotype-defying first like an NFL player. And I think that's going to be an example and an inspiration for, for so many. Um, and yet, uh, as you say, around the country, we're seeing what basically amounts to a political strategy of targeting some of the most vulnerable people in America, uh, which is transgender youth. And it's built on a very dangerous falsehood, which is some politicians asserting that there's no such thing as being transgender, and that's just not true. And it's incredibly dangerous, physically dangerous, uh, because saying that uh, transgender people don't exist is basically the same as saying that transgender people shouldn't exist. And uh, especially when you think about young people who hear that message from people in positions of responsibility, some of those young people might believe that message. And so we've got to push back with everything that we've got, first of all, on these laws that are a step back. And by the way, laws that will be a step forward, like the Equality Act, uh, but also simply sending that message that, that, that I'm proud to, to work for a president who sends that message and I'm proud to echo it, that there are a lot of people uh, for Anyone out there who's wondering whether they fit in, whether they belong, whether they're going to be safe, there are a lot of people who have your back. Well, Secretary Buttigieg, thanks so much for this conversation, um, both forward-looking and uh, and also about the the present intense conversation that we're having here in Washington about the future of infrastructure. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great to be with you.